Amen. You may be seated. That felt good, didn't it? You know why it felt so good? Because you were created for that moment. That's why He woke you up. He put breath in your lungs today to praise Him. You see, when you were born, a song was given to you, a song of praise. Now, I'm not talking about music. I'm not talking about necessarily singing, though it may involve it. I'm just saying a song of praise. God created you to worship Him. And the song never stops, only the singer. So it's time to sing again. And it's time to declare again, our God is worthy. I know a week ago, two weeks ago when I stood in front of you, I was heavy laden. Man, I felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders. And I can remember the sense of God saying, it's not bigger than me. It's not bigger than me. Trust me. And I just want you to know this morning that God brought you here for a reason. You didn't get here accidentally. He brought you here because he wants you to see him. Because in seeing him, then you realize why you exist. And you realize just how great and how awesome God is. In, this, in the book of Acts, the early church survived and thrived and changed their world with worship and prayer. Limitless is just a series title. But it's also a great way to describe what happens when people pray and what happens when people worship. God visits, God moves, God just blesses. In fact, if I could summarize what the church we read about in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, they worshiped boldly in public. They, didn't, they weren't ashamed. Listen, don't, don't be ashamed. You want to stand, you want to lift your hands, you want to express yourself in worship. Listen, there's not anybody else in here that is your object of concern but one and it is God it is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that's it we worship to an audience of one so never let those around you and they would do that they were bold and the second thing is that when they worshiped they would worship no matter what remember in Acts 5 they were beaten but, but they rejoiced and they worshiped because they considered it worthy to suffer for his name. The reason we come into this room as worship is not because we've had a good week. It's not because our life is good. It's because our God is good. And he is always worthy of our worship. And they worshiped and God moved. And you remember when he shook the building in Acts 4? He honored them. He gave them favor and used them to change the world. So I believe that that's what God wants to do with his worshiping church today. But let me tell you, it's dismal what's happening in the American church. This is a Barna study from 2007. I removed a few years, but I'm probably sure it's still very much the same. This was a survey done not among people who don't attend. And this was not a survey for those who attend every once in a while. This is for very active church-going people. And the questions were about worship. Listen to this. 32% of the core of people in the church in America say they have never experienced the presence of God in worship. 32%. 16% say they haven't experienced it in the last year. So you add those together, we're talking about almost half of the church in America, they don't experience the presence of God in worship. Two-thirds cannot describe what real worship is. And this is the one that really breaks your heart, and this is probably the reason the others are what they are. Less than half see worship as a priority. Really? Less than half? And now you wonder why God isn't showing up in powerful ways and manifesting himself among us and using us to change the world? When we don't even consider the reason we exist to be a big deal when what he values most and what he honors most and what he seeks most we don't even make it a priority or don't consider it a priority no wonder the church is anemic and tepid and weak because God is looking for folks who worship who will honor him and glorify him and fulfill the purpose for which they were given life on this planet and one of the greatest teachings on worship is found in the Gospel of John. I want you to turn to John chapter 4. Chapter 4 of John. This is the woman at the well of Samaria. The woman at the well. It, it, let me just give you a little context. 
In fact, I was thinking this morning as, as I was speaking, I think this is the first passage of Scripture I ever preached from when I was a, even a teenager. I was asked to come speak at a church. I, I remember the church well. It closed down two weeks after I was there. But it, this, is, <laughs> this is the passage that I used. It was the woman at the well in John 4. And man, I stood there and told them everything I knew. And seven minutes later, we, we had the invitation and, and it was over. Now, don't get any ideas. I've learned a little bit since then. I've learned a lot more, so it may take more than seven minutes, but here's the point. This is an incredible teaching on worship. And it happens at a well in Samaria, and it happens in a way that really shouldn't have happened. That is, a woman was talking to a Jewish man, which she should not have been. She was a Samaritan woman of all things, and she was a woman who got around. She'd been married five times. The man she was with was not her own. So there's everything wrong, but then there's everything right about this moment. And there is a discussion with Jesus. She didn't know who he was. There was a discussion about water. And Jesus makes a statement to her about living water and how that you drink of the water that he has and you'll never thirst again. So her response is, well, give me some of that water so I don't have to come back to this well. In other words, just hook me up straight to Dasani or Fiji and I'm good. I'll, I'll, I'll have all the water I want. She had no clue he wasn't talking about physical water. But what he's about to say all of a sudden opened her eyes. This is no ordinary man. In honor of his word, I want you to stand with me. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. You listen as I read. Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. So yes, what you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Really, what brought you to that conclusion, lady? Just a wild guess? This guy's just told you everything about your life. So now she realizes he's no ordinary man. And she believes him to be a prophet. Now watch what she first, the first subject she brings up. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming. Second time that's used. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know the, that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. May the Lord add his blessing to the word. You may be seated. I want you to write three words down on your listening guide that has this text printed. Write these three words down. Reason response, and relationship. As we begin a series on worship, I think this passage gives us a great glimpse into what God is looking for in worship. The word reason, write this sentence. Worship is the reason we exist. It's why we exist. Isn't it interesting, this Samaritan woman, the first subject she brought up with Jesus was about worship. Why is that? It's in every heart. It's in every heart. You may be the most pagan person, meaning you don't believe, you've pushed, but you worship something. There are people today on the planet worshiping rocks, trees, animals, ancestors. Within the human heart, God created a capacity for worship and a desire for worship. Augustine got it right. Man, our heart is restless until it finds God. Every one of us, we're created for this. It's the reason we exist. And that song that we sang just now in the verses Lindsay read, 
says that basically one day every living creature will worship him. And it named the creatures in the sea and on the earth and under the earth. That's demons. That's the, that's the code word for the devil. It's the code word for Satan and the demons. Every created thing, everything will worship him. Isn't that amazing? That God created this universe and designed us in such a way that we will worship him. And he desires for us, but even more than that, you need to worship him. It's a part of what it means being human. It's a part of what it means to be created in the image of God. And if you have no object of worship that is bigger than you, I pity you. For the one I worship is bigger than anything and bigger than me for sure. And God calls us to that. Jesus reminds us of that. The woman reminds us of that. That's the reason we exist. Listen to John Frame. He said, redemption is the means. Worship is the goal. In one sense, worship is the point of everything. It's the purpose of history. You realize that, that history is on a straight line. I mean, it's on a collision course with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So is history cyclical? I don't really think so. I think it's linear. I think it's a line. And it's a line that started with Jesus. It's a line that ends with Jesus. Now, if it's a circle, then I know where the circle starts and I know where it stops. It stops with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's where it started. Every one of us, born with a song in our heart. Born with a cre- capacity to worship and a need to worship. I like what Judson Cornwall said. He said, it's not that man cannot live without worship. It's that he cannot fully live without worship. Man was made to worship as surely as he was made to breathe. Worship is to your soul what breathing is to your body. Back in the late 80s, I think it was 88 actually, some whales got trapped in the Arctic Circle. And and many of you were not around in 88, but, but if you were, you might remember the story. The Eskimos actually went, and they were the ones who found them, and they began to drill holes in the ice. Whales are mammals. They have to breathe. If they're under the ice, they're going to die. And so the Eskimos would drill holes and the whales would come up for air. And then the Eskimos would go a little further and they'd drill another hole and then we began to help them do that. And basically we drilled holes until we worked the whales to open water. There are a lot of you that have been under the ice and it's time to breathe. Life is suffocating you. And just like those whales needed air, you need to come up and breathe every once in a while. You got to. There's no way you're going to fully live the life that God intends you to live in this world until you learn how to breathe even when you're under the weight of the world. In fact, let's do something. If worship is to our soul what breathing is to our body, do we hunger for worship as much as we hunger for air? Let's see if we can hold our breath collectively for 30 seconds. Okay, we do it? We got a clock, we got a clock up here? All right, put the clock up. Are you ready? Okay, everybody, wait, wait, wait. We'll start on my command, but everybody just relax, okay? I did this in the first service, and somebody came up and said, the guy next to me, I don't think he ever breathed again. So I'm just, I'm I'm hoping we're okay here. Let's try, let's try. On your mark, get set. Oh, now some of you young bucks, y'all could have gone for a minute or two. Any free divers in the room, you know what it's like. You can hold your breath forever. But did it not feel good to breathe? Did you not feel that sense of, oh, I'm so, I got to breathe, I got to breathe? That's the way we ought to hunger for God in worship. We ought to be so hungry. We ought to be just so desirous that we could just look up and worship Him. That's breathing 
It's the reason we exist. The second thing, the second R word was response. Worship is our response to all that God's done. It's simple. It's just our response to what God has done. It takes many forms. Our response takes many forms, but it's our response to what God has done. Go back to the text. This one really intrigued me. Last night, Danny and I were talking about the Scripture, and he put a thought in my mind, and I woke up at 3 this morning. Um, my body clock is all messed up from traveling back from Rome uh, a couple of nights ago, and I, I woke up at 3, wide awake, and, um, and the thought hit me, and I, and I wrote this down. I want to show you. I believe it was from the Lord. Do you see when he says, verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Now, I don't think Jesus was being demeaning to the woman. You know, you guys worship what you don't know. I, no, I don't think he was at all. Here's what he was saying. Until you have been saved, then you really understand worship. It's a response to God's saving grace. Before then, you're worshiping what you don't know, but when you know He saved you, then it changes your worship. Why? Because your worship is a response to the goodness of God. It's a response to His salvation. And above all people, who ought to be singing the loudest? Who ought to be worshiping the loudest? Those of the redeemed, those who have been saved by His grace, we ought to be lifting the rafters. If you don't have another reason in the world to sing, another reason in the world to worship, to look up and to praise Him, let, let me give you one. Number one, He saved you from your sin. He delivered you from the penalty of death. He set you free from the darkness, and He transferred you to a kingdom of light. And He is living within you right now. He is with you every moment of your life. And one day when life ends, He will come for you, and He will take you by the hand and walk you into a place called heaven where the streets are gold, the walls are jasper, the gates are absolutely unbelievable and there will be no more tears there will be no more sickness there will be no more dying no more goodbyes and we will live forever in the presence of the one who died for us now if that's not enough reason to worship then I don't know what is worship is our response to that it's just saying God we know we're not like this woman we know what you've done and so we got to respond. How can we be silent when God has been so good to us? Worship is not music, but it may take the form of music. You can worship and never sing. You can worship with a song. But see, a lot of people think worship is music. Listen, I've been to a lot of concerts that were not worship. My favorite band in high school and college, ZZ Top, I did not worship I stood right at the front row in front of those speakers, and I'm telling you, I had an incredible time, but I never once looked at the heavens and worshiped my God. But it was music. Do not confuse music with worship. Music may help you worship, but music is not the goal of worship. It may be a means. And worship is not a program. It's not a service. It's not, oh, well, we're going to worship today. Listen, I hope you worship every day. Worship is not an hour a week. If you say, well, I, you know, I worship an hour a week. Oh, my goodness. Is God just good to you an hour a week? Is God just with you an hour a week? Did he just save you an hour a week? No, God is with us. So our worship ought to be continual. And every once in a while I hear people say, well, the singing, all that worship, that just is the warm-up for the pastor. That's a pet peeve of mine, by the way. Don't ever say that to me. I'll have to hold my mouth in my hand so I won't do something I'll regret. Worship is not a warm-up. It is the game. It is the game. We were created for it. So it's not a program. It doesn't stop and start. And then worship is not a feeling. This is, this is one that every once in a while people get really confused. They walk out of worship and say, well, I just didn't feel much today. Oh, really? What were you looking for? Or the other side, man, it was great worship. Really? Yeah, I cried. Man, I had chills. I did as easy top. That was awesome, man. Emotions don't mean you worship. Now, sometimes they're there. Sometimes they're not. But remember, God is bigger than your feelings. And your feelings are so shifting and changing. Let's not even mention the hormone word. I mean, you've got all kinds of emotions going on. 
Do not trust your emotions to understand your worship. Worship is anchored in the character of God and your response to Him, not how you felt about it. I can tell you this. I think, I had a man come to see me that day out of a Roman Catholic background, wonderful guy. He's been coming here, and he came in. He was so, he was so moving. He said, Pastor, I, I don't know what it is, but when I come to church there and I listen to you, I cry. And, and is that okay? As I'm thinking, I'm, there are a lot of people I've made cry. But I said, do you cry because of something I said? He said, I don't know what it is. It's just I weep when I come into that church, and, and, and I'm there. What is it? And I just told him, I hope it is the Spirit of God that is touching you and breaking your heart and softening you for what he wants to do in your life. But you know what? If you don't cry, you still worship. And, and if you don't feel the chills, you still worship. In fact, my prediction is some of your greatest worship moments, you're going to feel nothing. And that's when your worship is pure because you're not dependent on feeling. You're stripped away of all that stuff and all the emotion and all the feelings, and it's just you and God, and you are praising Him, though you don't understand Him. A lot of people, I met with a lady this morning. She's waiting on a kidney transplant. I met with another young lady who said goodbye to her sister. They buried her just last week. I can promise you, when you've gone through something traumatic, you're numb. You don't feel anything. But that doesn't stop you from worshiping. In fact, it's then your worship is at its purest form because you're not using feeling. It's just you and God, and you're saying, God, I don't understand why this happened, but I just know this, you're an awesome God, and I'm going to praise you for the rest of my days. That is worship that honors him. So it's not the feeling. It's not a program. It is simply a response. And the two words, biblically, that describe worship that are most often used for worship, the number one word is shaha. That's in Hebrew. It's used 112 times in the Old Testament. The Greek version of it is proskunine. That is a verb that literally means to kiss forward or literally to kiss the feet of someone. Shaha means to get on your face before God. The second most often used is the word abad in Hebrew and Greek latruo. It means to serve, which next week we're going to look at Romans 12, 1, where he uses that word about I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, and most people who have learned that verse say service. It's actually the word worship. You see, I think worship is serving God. Worship is when you get on your face before God. And all of these, these two words especially, describe our response. Now, let's talk about our response. There are many responses in the Scripture to God in terms of worship. Sometimes you sit. Sometimes you stand. Sometimes you speak aloud and shout to the Lord. Sometimes you be still and know that He is God. Sometimes you lift hands. Sometimes you bow. Sometimes you dance. Yes, dance. And sometimes you don't. If you were to take the worship of the Old Testament, it is so full of color. It is so multi you know, it's, it's just, it's got a little bit of everything. And, and so, I will say to you that let your response be your response. If you want to lift your hands, lift your hands. If you want to say amen, say amen. You want to shout, you shout. If you want to get on your face before God, you get on your face before God. And don't you let anybody around you tell you that you are not worshiping because you didn't do something or you did something. Worship is from you to God, and you respond any way you choose to respond. There will be freedom in this place to worship our God because that is what He invites us to do. So you worship. What is it? Sometimes I stand. Sometimes I, I don't. But there are many ways to respond to him. And if I had to pick words that would describe our response in all of the different forms that would best describe what God's looking for, one, wonder, awe, humility. Wonder means you're, you're worshiping because you were lost in the wonder of God. You see, I think that is probably one of the things that people like me who grew up in the church, it's dangerous for us because the holy becomes common. We lose the wonder of God. I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but I've got a question for you. Have you lost the wonder of who he is? Do you still stand amazed? My greatest, my favorite hymn, favorite song, and always will be, I stand amazed in the presence 
of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. That old hymn just says it for me. I'll never get over it. I don't want to be professional. I don't want to get to be professional where I can just do it just because it's my job. I want to stand in front of him and be absolutely in awe. I never want to lose the wonder. And then the word humility. You realize the Bible says the only offering of worship he will never reject. It's not a song. It's not giving. What's the only offering the Scripture says he'll never reject? A broken heart. Psalm 51, 17. He said, I will not despise a broken heart. I will not push it away. That is the sacrifice of God, is that you come with a broken and contrite heart. All of this is just give this beautiful picture of how we respond to God because of what he's done for us. And we do it with humility. We do it in wonder and awe of who he is and what he's done for us. Now, I want to show you a picture. I hope it's not you. I pray it's not us. And I'm going to go back to my first grade days when I slept under the Christmas tree one night and opened up this package the next morning. This is Bugs Bunny, if you can't recognize him. He's a little worn. He's had a rough day or two. Uh, I actually cut his arm off once, but I sewed it back on, if you can see the... He had a little vertebrae problem, so I did surgery on his neck. And how I've managed to keep him for all these years, I have no idea. But I loved that little Bucks Bunny. I, you know, as a kid, I, I don't do this anymore. Let me make sure you understand. I don't sleep with Bugs. I don't. Yeah. Her name is Rachel, not Bugs. So. But let me show you something about Bugs Bunny. He, he's, a, he's a stuffed animal. Okay? He's just a stuffed animal. In fact, what's interesting, when I got here, um, Danny wasn't on staff. He was a member of the church. And, man, everybody, when I, they'd mentioned Danny, said, oh, yeah, he's just a doll. And I kind of got a little nervous about that. And I looked it up, and doll means stuffed dummy. So I, now I understand a lot more about <laughs> what they were saying about Danny. But, but that's bugs. That's all he is. He's a stuffed dummy. Now watch this. Don't be a stuffed dummy in worship. Your God's been good to you. And as much as I can hug this little fellow and just say, man, I love you and just, you know, treasure him, watch this. When I let go and I'm waiting for him, his response, there's his response. He does nothing. Why? He's a stuffed dummy. Don't be a stuffed dummy. Your God has been too good to you. Worship is when you hug God back. He has embraced you by grace. He has given you freedom in the Spirit. He has set your life free. Don't be a dummy. Love Him. Respond to Him. Worship is a response. Worship is why we live. It's our reason for existing. And the last thing, worship is a relationship. It's our relationship with God. Go back to the text, if you will. The hour is coming and is now here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, what, what was the point of that? The point is that she was convinced that the Samaritans worshipped at Mount Gerizim, the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem. And by the way, she's right. The Samaritans were half-breeds. They were the result of the Assyrians coming in from the north, causing the fall of the northern kingdom. Then they married the Israelites. And the result were generations called Samaritans. They were despised by the Jews. They had their own Pentateuch. There was a, a Samaritan Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And they had their own place of worship, Mount Gerizim. The Jews had Jerusalem. So this woman is caught up in this war, these traditions. And Jesus says, woman, the hour is coming and is now here. It's not about worshiping there. It's not about worshiping there. The Father is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. Let me just make a couple of comments. Worship is really not about us. It's about us. It's about Him. And you worship best out of relationship with Him. And so when I say worship is out of relationship, that's, that's what God has done for you.
And now that you are his child, worship is a way of responding to him in this beautiful relationship that he has given through his son, Jesus Christ. And you realize, worship is only made possible by the death of Jesus Christ. In other words, when he died on the cross, remember what happened in the temple? As soon as Jesus died in the temple, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom and was pulled open as if to say God was inviting us to come. And so now that we have relationship with God, we worship out of that. I still feel like a lot of our worship is about us. And I'll be the first to tell you, for me, it's been a struggle. I'm going to tell you a story that you're going to find it maybe a little hard to believe because I, I, I love all kinds of worship and styles. But back when Saddleback, years before Rick Warren wrote the book, Purpose Driven Life, uh, I went out to Saddleback. I wanted to go to a conference. I wanted to see this church. I didn't know Rick personally at the time, but I wanted to see what was going on. So I went out there. I remember getting there, and, man, it was packed, and I had to sit in some bleachers. And it was kind of like where you guys are in the, in the terrace seating I was up in the bleachers, and, and I look up, and the band comes out, and the, the worship leader came out in a Hawaiian shirt, and as soon as the band started, he starts jumping. And I promise you, I'm sitting there, and I'm going, what is this about? And so they start singing this song I didn't know. I'd never heard it before. And I remember my body language. language. I just kind of did this, and I said, oh, this just doesn't do it for me. And then they did another song, same thing. Didn't know the song. He's jumping up and down that Hawaiian shirt, and I'm just kind of going, well, this just doesn't do it for me. The third time I said that, almost as audible as my voice is to you, when I said, this just doesn't do it for me, God said, it isn't really about you. And I'll never forget that. And that day, God broke my spirit. And I want to encourage you, be real careful that you don't allow your preferences to be more important than your relationship to your God. Don't allow your style of worship or your preference for worship or your expressions of worship. I, I think it's perfectly fine to have those preferences. We all have a heart language. If I got in your vehicle and I were to go through the presets of your radio station, we don't all listen to the same music. We have different tastes. There may not be a ZZ Top fan in the bunch. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? But there may be. But here's what I'm saying. Be real careful looking at somebody else and saying, oh, no, that's not real worship. Don't say that. Worship is about relationship. It's not about style. It's not about an instrument. Because you hear what the Bible says? Jesus said the Father is seeking worshipers. He's seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. The word seek is the same word for Luke 19. Verse 10, when it says the Father, Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So you might say, in the same way he's seeking people to be saved, he is seeking worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. What does spirit and truth mean? Well, in spirit, it says, because God is the spirit. That means that we don't worship a certain place. Jerusalem, it doesn't matter. It's not about a place. Why? God is the spirit. He's everywhere. And by the way, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so now you are the place of worship. You carry it with you. You don't leave church today. The church leaves today. And so that means that you ought to be able to worship on Sunday morning just like you do on Monday morning sitting in traffic on I-4. Do I get a witness? Amen. We need to worship. We got to worship. So worship is really that relationship. And it's about realizing it's not in the flesh, meaning somebody or some instrument. Here's, here's a funny story. I, everybody has their preference. They like certain instruments. They want the rhythm guitar. They want a lead guitar. They, they want acoustic. They want organ. They want whatever. In First Baptist Church of Houston, in the 1900s, they brought a new instrument into the worship room, and it was so rejected violently by the people of First Baptist of Houston, it disappeared in two weeks. They found it at the bottom of the bay. Anybody want to guess what instrument it was that was so obnoxious and so irreverent that they would bring it into the house of worship? I'll point to it. You think I'm going for the drums. 
It was an organ. An organ. My goodness, an organ. And I hear people tell them, well, I just got to have an organ to worship. I just got to have this to worship. Well, you know, that's okay. That's your preference. That's fine. But listen, organs, guitars, drums are not the end. They are the means to the end. Don't worship the instrument. Worship the God who is worthy of your praise. Let whatever God uses. Did you see the sun? Probably not. But did you see the sunrise this morning? Anybody? What an incredible sunrise. I mean, it was gorgeous. And God did that so we would be reminded to worship Him. So to worship in spirit means I don't get hung up with a place. I don't have to be at my church. I don't have to have the guitar. I don't have to have the organ. Why? God is spirit. I can worship Him anywhere, anytime. And to worship in truth means this. I mean what I say, and what I say is true. God doesn't like hypocrisy. He doesn't want us singing songs we don't mean. That's why when we sing them, we got to mean them. And he definitely wants us to sing things that are true, that are accurate. That's why I love people who write straight out of the Scripture. I like, like Hillsong. I mean, you take Tomlin and some of these guys. They are writing worship stuff that comes straight out of this book. I mean, straight out of this book. And by the way, there are people who every once in a while get all upset and call them 7-Eleven courses, saying the same thing, you know, seven words 11 times or whatever. And I always like to refer him to Psalm 136. Because that psalm says the same thing a whole lot of times. You might want to be careful because the author of Psalm 136, you would probably want to avoid making him upset. You see, it's not about words. It's about him. And to worship in truth means I'm singing the truth and I mean what I sing. My first church, I was the worship leader. It was a disaster. I was 19 years old. Oh, my goodness. I wouldn't have joined that church. I wouldn't have gone, but they paid me to show up every week. So I was, I was the pastor, you know. And so I'm leading the hymns. And every once in a while, I'd go, anybody got a hymn they want to sing? And, and they always chose, early on, they chose this hymn. And I knew where it was in the Heavenly Highways hymnal. It was a song called, Ain't It a Shame. And here's a line out of that song. Ain't it a shame to gossip on Sunday? Ain't it a gossip and shame? Ain't it a shame to gossip on Sunday when you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday? First time we sang it, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> We're singing a song about gossiping on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I said, no more. Can't sing that one. To worship in truth means what we're saying is true. And it also means what we're saying we mean. So what we're about to do is worship in spirit and truth. And we're going to use a song that Hillsong has released. We sang it about two weeks ago. But I'm going to ask you to read the words with me before we sing it. And I want to tell you a story. When we were in Rome just a few days ago, on the Journeys of Paul trip, we went in the Pantheon. The Pantheon is this beautiful old building that has this dome, and it's kind of a, a circular building that was built, rebuilt in 8, listen, 114 A.D. It was originally built before Christ, uh, dedicated to the God of Mars, and now it is dedicated to the Pantheon, which means all the gods of the Romans. Well, I'd been in this building a couple of times before, so I took the little earpiece where you're listening to the person guiding us, and I got my iPhone, and I put my little Beats earplugs in, and I turned this song on. Here's why. I'm in a place dedicated to all the gods of the Romans. But I only know one God who sent his son to die for my sin. And I will forever praise his name. I want to sing truth. I want to declare there is one God, and I know what he did for me. So you know what? I'm through doing that. I will forever reach up to the heavens to embrace my God, to say thank you for what you did for me.